Much of the chemistry we do is what's called aqueous chemistry. This is where we have dissolved substances into water, in which case we call them aqueous in that state. And when they're aqueous, their ions being dispersed or their particles being dispersed means we can mix them all together and have those par particles or ions interact with each other and undergo reaction. One of the, the many useful properties of dealing with chemistry in the aqueous phase. Now why do we dissolve things in water versus some other substance? Well, water is actually very special as a molecule. One of the things that makes it unique is that it has what's called innate dipoles. So it has positive charges, partial positive charges on the hydrogens and partial negative charges on the oxygen. And whenever you have charges a fixed distance from each other, that's what's called a dipole. Because of the presence of these dipoles, water molecules are very good at interacting with other charged substances, such as ions. Hi water can also form hydrogen bonds with itself. It's a relatively strong bond between molecules. It occurs where the negative oxygen associates with the positive hydrogens. Water can also break itself apart into ions. So even if we don't have any ions that we've added to our, our water, we just have a pure sample, water is gonna create ions all by itself. So we have two water molecules. One of them can donate a hydrogen to the other one. We get what's called hydronium, H3O plus. And the water molecule that gave away its hydrogen is now OH minus, that's called hydroxide. One of the major results of all these crazy properties is that water is very good at dissolving substances, especially ionic compounds, because it can interact with those strong ionic charges. Since water has such strong interactions with ionic compounds, we're gonna restrict our discussion to ionic compounds for the moment. We might ask the question, what makes an ionic compound dissolve in water? Is every ionic compound going to dissolve? Well, what makes it dissolve is if the interactions with the water molecules are stronger than the interactions it would have just being by itself and having the positive cations interact with the negative anions. So it's not always going to dissolve. We're going to have to, to discriminate. One of our clues to whether or not our substance is going to dissolve is if we have weakly charged ions. So we have, for example, plus one and minus one charges, which are relatively small. Well, because they're relatively small, then that might make having all of these water molecules with their partial negative and partial positive charges be a good exchange compared to, to being over in the ionic compound form. And so something like NaCl is going to be soluble and we put it in water, it's going to split into Na plus and Cl minus because it's decided this is a, a better arrangement, it gives it stronger interactions overall. If we add something like calcium oxide, however, now we have plus two charges and minus two charges. These interactions are strong enough that it's, it's better to stick together in the solid form. We don't get a good enough exchange by dissolving into water. The other thing that might make a difference in determining solubility is the size of the ions. We have very large ions and we can fit a large number of water molecules around them. So we can have a lot of these partial negative charges from the oxygens or a lot of these partial positive charges from the hydrogens. And so here, barium sulfide is gonna be soluble. The, the barium two plus gets all of these waters and the S2 minus as well gets all these waters, and that's more favorable than the situation it is as a solid compound. So it's going to dissolve. But if we were to look up the group that barium is in, those alkaline earth metals, magnesium is very similar to barium, but it's smaller. And because it's smaller, we're able to fit less water molecules around it. And so that's going to decrease the benefit of going into the aqueous phase. And in fact, it decreases it enough that magnesium sulfide tends to be relatively insoluble. It's better to stay in this form over here and get the benefit of these S2 minus charges 
than it is to go into the aqueous form where you only get a, a few waters to help neutralize that plus two charge. Well, in reality, we don't have a really great way to just look at a compound and know if it's soluble. Instead, you're going to use a chart. The chart summarizes information from a number of experiments that have been done with all of these compounds. What we'll do is you'll look up either the cation or the anion. Sometimes one may be listed or the other might be listed. And you'll, you'll scroll down. Let's say we have calcium sulfate. So we go down to sulfates, and we would see that they're soluble in general. Then we'll also want to check if there is a special exception. So we look over here, and we see that indeed there is an exception for calcium sulfate. It's only slightly soluble. So slightly soluble means that most of it is going to remain undissolved, but a very small portion of it actually will dissolve. Just enough to have some chemical effect in the solution, but not enough that all of our solid is going to disappear. So for example, let's see if we can figure out whether these are soluble salts. We have sodium carbonate, silver chloride, and calcium oxide. Sodium carbonate, sodium is an alkali metal. So let's check. Alkali metals are always soluble. There's no exceptions. If we did check for carbonates, we would find that they're generally insoluble, but alkali metals are an exception. So this is going to be soluble. Silver chloride, look for chlorides here. They tend to be soluble, but there is an exception for silver. Silver halides, halides are everything in that second to last group in the periodic table, chlorine and bromine and iodine, etc. Uh, these are insoluble. So this is going to be insoluble. And then calcium hydroxide. Let's look for hydroxides. Here's hydroxides. These tend to be insoluble. Calcium hydroxide is slightly soluble. So some of it will dissolve, but mostly it won't. We'll generally consider that to be insoluble. So what this means is if we have our sodium carbonate and we put it in solution, add some water to it, then it will convert into ions. So we'll get sodium ions and we'll get carbonate ions. Note that the quantities are balanced. Two sodiums, two sodiums, one carbonate, one carbonate. And the charges are balanced. Two positive charges and one negative two charge all comes out to zero. Now to indicate that it's been dissolved in the solution, we'll write aqueous, abbreviated AQ, as its phase. And that means that it's dissolved in the water. When we have ions dissolved in solution, we can, of course, add more ions into our solution. And adding more ions might change the situation. We might have what's called a precipitation reaction. This is where ions bump into each other and form an insoluble compound, where the forces of attraction between those ions are stronger than the forces of attraction to the water molecules. And so in that case, they will drop out of the solution as a solid precipitate. So imagine that we have sodium chloride as a solution. If we look this up in our solubility rules, we'll see that sodium chloride is soluble. So if we add NaCl to our solution, it will break up into Na plus ions surrounded by water molecules and Cl minus ions surrounded by water molecules. We won't have any actual NaCl. Same thing for silver nitrate. Our silvers will form ions and our nitrates will form ions. We won't see any silver nitrate crystals in our solution. But let's now take our sodium chloride and add it to our silver nitrate. Now these chlorine ions can bump into these silver ions. And if we check our solubility rules, we'll see that silver chloride is insoluble. 
that means that the forces of attraction between silver and chlorine are stronger than the forces of attraction between either and water. So, they, once they bump into each other, they're going to stick together. They aren't going to attract back into the solution. So we'll accumulate a solid precipitate of silver chloride. Now our sodiums, when they interact with these nitrates, if we check, we'll see that sodium nitrate is soluble. And so sodium nitrate is going to remain in the dissolved phase. It's not going to clump together and form a precipitate. There are a few different ways of representing what's happening notationally. One is what's called a complete ionic equation. In this case, we simply list all the ions and substances which are present. So we would list our chlorine and our sodium and our nitrate and our silver all as ions and the reactant side. And then on the product side, we form this solid silver chloride and then the nitrate and the sodium remain aqueous ions. And this should be balanced so it should indicate the correct stoichiometric amounts of all these ions. Now we can also represent this a little bit more compactly since the sodium here doesn't really change and the chlorine here does change and the silver does change and the nitrate doesn't. We'll just go ahead and ignore the ions which don't change. We'll just write the reaction between the silver and the chlorine to produce silver chloride. These ions that we've emitted, because they didn't do anything, they're called spectator ions. They're just kind of watching in the stands. And the last way we might represent this is what's called a molecular equation. So in this case, what we are going to do is we're going to essentially group the ions together, even though they aren't really together in compounds in the solution. But we're going to group them to form neutral charges. So even though the sodium chloride is actually in a plus ions and Cl minus ions completely separate from each other floating around the solution. We'll go ahead and call it NaCl anyway, maybe because we started with some solid NaCl salt. Same for the silver nitrate. We'll write our solid silver chloride, so this is actually true. And then we'll group our remaining sodium nitrate ions. So this whole time we're going to go ahead and pretend our ions form neutral compounds in order to write this. And these aqueous subscripts are what tell us that this isn't really existing as a NaCl solid, but simply that we have Na ions and Cl minus ions together in the solution. All right, well, what would happen if we took some lead nitrate and some potassium iodide. Maybe these are starting out as solid salt crystals. And we added them to the same aqueous solution. Would anything happen? Would nothing happen? What would be the consequence of performing these additions? Well, the first thing we'll want to do is we'll want to check if these are soluble. Are they just going to fall to the bottom of our flask and remain as solids? Or are they going to dissolve into the solution? So we could start with lead nitrate here. So nitrates are soluble according to our solubility rules. That means that this is going to dissolve. It's going to form lead 2 plus and two nitrates, each with minus one charge. Now if we check our other substance, potassium iodide, potassium is an alkali metal, which, is, which are soluble. Iodides are also soluble. So we expect that this is also going to dissolve, form K plus and I minus in the solution. So these are both going to dissolve, but are they going to stay dissolved? Well, these ions, remember, they can bounce into each other. They can all interact. So we also want to consider the interactions of K plus and PB2 plus, K plus and NO3 minus, I minus and PB2 plus, I minus and NO3 minus. Now for the minus minus interactions and the plus plus interactions, we already know those are going to repel, like charges repel. But what about these other interactions? Well, let's go ahead and see if any new solids might form in those cases. So what if our positive potassium 
which is dissolved in the solution, interacts with our negative nitrate. Will we potentially form this coupling here, potassium nitrate? Well, we check our solubility rules, and again, alkali metals are always soluble. So imagine if we did have some solid potassium nitrate that we added to our solution. According to our solubility rules, it would immediately dissolve into K plus and O3 minus. So no, these K pluses and O3 minuses are not going to aggregate to form KNO3. Their attractions to the water are much stronger than their attractions to each other. But what about our other option? The Pb2 plus ions coupling with the I minus ions give us PbI2. Well, if we check our solubility rules in this case, when we look up iodides, we see that usually they're soluble, but there's an exception for PBBr2, PBI2, and PBCl2. These ones are all slightly soluble, which means mostly they do not dissolve. Mostly they remain in solid form. So in that case, we are going to form this solid precipitate. These ions would rather be clumped together rather than having those interactions with the water molecules. And so now we can go ahead and write this all in the form of a reaction equation. So if we did this the molecular way, we had lead nitrate and potassium iodide. And because we dissolved them, we'll go ahead and write these aqueous subscripts. They formed solid PBI2. And then the other ions did not form anything, but we'll go ahead and group them together anyway into kind of a pretend imaginary neutral compound. So we'll write potassium nitrate, and then we'll write this aqueous to remind ourselves that we just kind of made this up. We don't really have potassium nitrate. Now note that this is the unbalanced equation. So something that we have to do is we have to go back and make sure that not only that we have the correct substances, but that we have them in the correct stoichiometric amounts. So if we check here, we'll see that we have two of these iodine atoms on the right side and one on the left. So we'll have to go ahead and throw a coefficient of two in there. And since I now have two potassiums on the left, I'm going to need two potassiums on the right. And I have two nitrates now, and I have two nitrates, and I have one lead, and I have one lead. So everything is balanced. We can also express our equation as the complete ionic equation, in which case we will explicitly write all the ions as they actually exist in a solution. So the only thing that was a solid was our lead iodide. So we'll go ahead and leave that as a solid. And our lead nitrate we had found to be soluble, so it's actually going to exist as Pb2 plus and NO3 minus, of which there were two. Our potassium iodide was aqueous, and since there were two of them, then we also need two of the potassiums and two of the iodides in our equation. And likewise, two potassiums and two nitrates on the other side. Now we can simplify this in writing our net ionic equation. Since potassium appears on the left side and it appears on the right side, we also have two nitrates on the left side two nitrates on the right side. And we can think of, if you think, imagine this as an algebraic equation. We can you know, subtract two nitrates on the left, and because it's an equation, we do the same thing to the right side. So we cancel them out on both sides. And then we're just left with the ions which actually change form, and that's our net ionic equation. So Pb2 minus plus two of our iodides gives us our PbI2 solid.